right, that's great. So uh, our final speaker this morning is Kate Walsh. Dr. Walsh is Associate Professor at Iowa State University. Her research brings Hegel's thought to bear on contemporary debates in ethics. And her most recent work explores the ethics of borrowing, lending, repayment, and default. As part of that project, I guess, uh, she will speak to us today about debt and the limits of freedom. Dr. Walsh, the floor is yours. Great, thank you so much. Um, I've got a couple of slides I'm gonna share as well. Um, so while I'm loading that up, I'll just say it's such a pleasure to be here. Um, I, like Sebastian, I was fortunate to uh, write a dissertation with Terry a few years ago back at Northwestern. And it's really nice to be here and celebrate Terry and his work. Um, and also I'll say that, you know, I think Terry already knows this. I've always really been an ethicist at heart. Um, and so this conference has been a nice opportunity to kind of go back to my Hegel roots a little and also try try and connect more explicitly what I take to be a kind of Hegelian background to my research on the ethics of death. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that and then get your feedback um, on this idea. So the literature I'm engaging with is really a very cross-disciplinary literature that emerged after the financial crisis, which is, gosh, almost 14 years ago now. Um, and we see a lot of different folks contributing to this literature. We've got anthropologists very prominently, sociologists, political theorists, uh, legal theorists, um, also sort of across the spectrum, though not a lot of philosophers, very interesting. There's very little philosophical work contributing to this literature. So, um, you know, the, the crisis sort of dramatized and brought to the fore the extent to which uh, it, was a, it was a crisis that was at least in part caused by debt. And then afterward, there were also a lot of ethical dilemmas as well as political ones revolving around what to do about debt. So in this literature, some of the questions that emerge are, are essentially, you know, what did the crisis show us about the roles that debt is playing in our lives today? And debt not understood just in a really simplistic way, but as a deep sun, fundamental social relation. And so I'll come back, back to that in a little bit. Um, but, you know, what did, what did we learn about the role that debt is playing in our lives today? And specifically, there's a lot of discussion in this literature about what we could call mass indebtedness, the rise of the phenomenon that the, the majority of people in uh, developed economies are highly indebted. And along with it, an, an idea that comes essentially from Nietzsche, which is the idea of a moral imperative of repayment. Not just that we ought to repay our debts, but that the ethics of debt is really simple. There's nothing to say. We certainly see this idea in Kant that you know, we should pay our debts. Um, it's very simple. End of story. There's nothing really else to say about the ethics of debt. And, how did, and, and that we should also sacrifice lots of other goods and values in service of fulfilling that imperative. So how did that come to be? And then if we think there are problems with this, as basically all this literature does, um, very little of it um, commends the current situation, then what would a counter ethics of debt look like? How could we move forward with this? Um, and how would that uh, how would that proceed? So just to kind of motivate this work, um, I've got just two graphs really quickly that show us some things that are going on um, with what economists refer to as household debt or consumer debt. Um, this graph shows us just in the United States, but the United States is not an outlier. This is something that's going on in pretty much all advanced economies to varying degrees. If you've seen this show or heard of the show Squid Game, it's dramatizing the situation as it appears in South Korea currently um, and some of the moral challenges that arise for people in that, in, who are highly indebted. So after the, we, you know, there's a huge buildup of personal debt, um, which is my focus, um, leading up to the financial crisis and there's this deleveraging and then it starts going up again, right? Um, and it's actually a little higher than the, the end of this chart shows now. And one of the interesting things about this is the distribution of this debt. So if you go back, you know, to 50 years ago, you see a very different um, split on debt to income. So obviously everyone's increased in their debt to income ratio, but it's far more burdensome. And we've seen a real acceleration, especially for those who are in the bottom 80%. And I was kind of shocked, I shouldn't have been shocked, but I was somehow recently to come across this the statistic that um, over 70% of Americans are in debt when they die with an average balance of over $60,000. So this is debt that is carried through that is a sort of a constant part of our adult lives. Um, and especially for those who are in the bottom 80%, especially certain segments within that. Um, 
so when we talk about mass indebtedness, this is the kind of situation that folks are really worried about, which has obviously accelerated um, during the, since the early 2000s. I'll just point out real quick, the inflection point here is really the late 70s, early 80s, um, as we get uh, a sort of revolution in financial deregulation that spurs all sorts of, the creation of all sorts of new debts. But even there, it, would be, it was still um, building a little bit before that. So, um, so the question then that's kind of motivating this paper and a fair amount of my work on this actually is a question that came, I, came upon or came to me when I was talking with some debt activists who I have learned a lot from. I'm not an activist, but I, I love crossover events with them and I've learned a lot from them um, about how debt is actually operating in people's lives today. And one of them said to me in a conversation once, he said, how is this ethical or moral, this situation? And how is this freedom, right? He was uh, philosophically sophisticated enough to ask that quite in, articulate in terms of freedom. How does this count as freedom when folks are indebted to this extent and especially folks who are in the you know, bottom tiers economically in terms of their income are experiencing this as a real constraint, as a real burden, and as something that's really um, a diminishment of freedom, right? So something I've been doing in some of my research is then looking at the history of the ethics of debt and philosophical thought about this. Um, so I published some work on uh, looking at ancient and medieval thoughts and how that developed. And basically the focus there was, this we're talking about Aristotle and Aquinas primarily, but also several others. Um, the focus was on the ethics of lending and the idea that usury is really unnatural and exploitative in Aristotle's sense. It's exploitative because it's a way for those who have means to try to extract more money from those who are, need our help as opposed to um, exploitation. Then when we get to the modern period, very interestingly, there's pushback against this. And we see this early on with Calvin and Luther and Bacon but then also Grotius and Pufendorf, Smith, um, Adam Smith and Bentham. Um, we see this, this idea that, well, those ancient um, views and you know, the prohibitions on lending and interest that appear in the New Testament and the Old Testament, they're anachronistic. They don't fit the modern world anymore. We need, to go, we need to go in a different direction. And so then there's this view articulated, oh, that lenders are actually doing us all a service by providing credit because they're increasing wealth for the society and individual opportunities for wealth, but also freedom. We get this articulation, especially in Smith and Bentham of the idea that there is freedom um, that is increased through lending. So um, thank you to the lenders is essentially the view. Okay, so that's the kind of big history behind all this, but then we get to Nietzsche. And Nietzsche is important in this discussion because first of all, of all, all these contemporary theorists um, who are looking at, the, at debt are reading Nietzsche and thinking about Nietzsche and taking him seriously. But also, of course, in our context, you know, Hegel's always hovering in the background, Nietzsche's thought. Um, and so what Nietzsche says then is he is this in the genealogy. He says, well, what this whole um, you know, background, the focus on ethics of lending that we've seen in the history of philosophy, what it's missing is a couple of things. First of all, um, it's only focusing on lending. Right, it's not focusing on the other side of the equation or other parts of um, debt, other pe other individuals involved in debt. Um, but also, he says, debt isn't just something that emerges as you know a, a borrowing and lending of money. It's a basic human relation um, that goes back to before money. It goes back to the beginning of human existence, essentially, that human beings have borrowed and lended from one another even before they had money. And this is a view that anthropologists have for quite a while now been agreeing with. I think that's absolutely right. Debt is something that goes back to long before, um, long before we had money. But what Nietzsche then says, and this is the critical point that folks are really interested in these days, is he says that there is a moral imperative of repayment. He doesn't quite use those words, but there's a moral imperative of repayment that we now have today. And this was constructed, it's not just unique to modernity either. He says this moral imperative was constructed when you had two things occur. First of all, early humans developed a concept of the divine to whom we owe our existence. And he has a story about that. And then second though, you get elites who are forcing us essentially into uh, civilization, into their um, you know, power structure for, for, to serve their ends. And then they co-opt that belief. They say, oh, well, you know, I am associated with the divine. So you owe me service as a way of um, serving God um, essentially. So this is a quote from David Graeber, um, which I will uh, come back to in just a second, but I think it captures this idea from Nietzsche really well. If history shows anything, it's that there's no better way to justify relations founded on violence to make them seem moral 
than by reframing them in the language of debt, above all because it immediately makes it seem that it's the victim who's doing something wrong. So here we get, I think, one of the nice things about this quote is it really emphasizes the, the worry about personal responsibility that is in Nietzsche and this contemporary literature that's a, a focus on it's your fault that you are in debt. And Nietzsche spends a lot of time talking about guilt and debt and the etymological connection in German um, between these words. Um, and the idea that um, I, as a debtor, am to blame for my situation. It's a private matter. I should be ashamed of it, right? And then so when we look at contemporary theorists, then they're taking this idea from Nietzsche and they are, you know, trying, they're saying, they want to suggest the whole way we've been taught to understand debt is really misguided. And specifically, David Graeber, who uh, is an anthropologist who died recently, um, he was, he published this kind of massive um, tome on debt uh, in the early 2010s and got a lot of this discussion going. He was also active in Occupy. He says, look, the concept of freedom, he thinks the concept of freedom is not going to be helpful to us here in thinking about debt going forward. Um, because historically it's been used to justify um, exploitative and predatory debt. So we could think about the a modern uh, narrative about debt that we see in Bentham and Smith, for instance. Um, but also, I think when we look, think about um, a simplistic view of debt, and this is clearly on display in Kant, um, it, there's a failure to take account of exploitative and predatory circumstances in which we're making our moral judgments. Um, so I'll say a little bit more about that on the next slide. But um, so that's one failure um, that has actually occurred with the concept of freedom. It hasn't been used to justify, he thinks, um, anything positive with regard to debt. But then second of all, when we think about the rise of mass indebtedness, which is really unprecedented in a number of ways, um, and there's a lot of scholarship on financialization that's occurred since around 1980 um, that I've been participating in, and a lot of that takes, tries to document the extent to which a financialization um, which for many people is um, fi finance is experienced essentially as debt. Um, how much, what a great influence it's playing on our lives, how much it's seeping into our relationships, um, our practices, our institutions. I think a great example of this is in the US, the influence of student debt on higher education at the moment, <clears throat> where I think um, probably most of us are here hyper aware of how our students' expectations and demands with regard to their education are, have changed because they're going into debt in order to pay for it. Um, and also, uh, you know, how much how it's changing institution and how we're responding to that in higher ed. Um, so it's free, it, Graeber concludes in that he says, you know, freedom really is not where we should look for if we're looking for normative concepts to to push back against the way debt has come to function in our lives. <clears throat> so my interest in Hegel then with regard to all this is um, sort of twofold. First of all, I'm interested in how can, as you know, a sort of as someone who has a background in Hegel, I'm interested in how can Hegel be used to contribute to this discussion. Um, in particular, I think Graeber's wrong to reject the idea of freedom, um, that it has any role to play in these discussions. But the problem is that a lot of discussions of freedom are really simplistic, and that doesn't work for debt because debt is not a simple issue. It's very, very complex. And the more I dig into I thought this was, when I started working on debt, I thought it was gonna be one paper that I wrote, and it's turned into you know eight years of research for me. Um, so that's one thing. What, can, what do I think Hegel can add to this discussion? But then secondly, what does this, does this have any implications for Hegel himself um, and what we should think about Hegel? So um, Terry notes, Terry tells us in his biography that um, Hegel doesn't, that Hegel himself was indebted um, to, a, to a friend, personal debt, um, a number of times in his life. And um, this would have been very uh, typical at that point in Germany that uh, personal banking was disorganized. Um, the only organized banking that would have been for manufacturing or for commercial interests, essentially. So if you needed a loan, you would go to a, a friend or a family member or maybe a local merchant. <laughs> so Hegel himself doesn't really talk about that much. There, I, you know, there are some little passages, but it's not that um, it's not very focused. But I do think, um, so one thing I think that Hegel can add to the discussion of the ethics of debt, um, discussion of debt is this conception of freedom, this really rich conception of freedom. And so I think it provides a really excellent um, illustration of the arguments that Hegel is making in the philosophy of right about both the strengths and the limitations of the different conceptions of freedom. So 
Um, the first one is the one we get in abstract right, and I'm using Neuhauser's terms here, you know, freedom, the conception of freedom as personal choice. And I think a couple of examples that I mentioned in the paper really illustrate very well the strengths of of this approach, of this, of this conception of freedom. Um, debt slavery, which still unfortunately exists, tens of millions of people in the world today, but also the demise of debtors' prisons. And Elizabeth Anderson has this really wonderful article where she, she doesn't call it Hegel, she doesn't use the language of Hegel, but she's basically arguing that the, um, a conception of freedom uh, in, in the markets is, which is essentially, you know, it, very similar to what Hegel is understanding, explaining this conception of freedom in abstract right, um, that that is what is responsible for the demise of debtors' prisons. So um, the, the sort of value of this conception of freedom and what it does. But then I think there are just also a lot of other examples where, th that illustrate the limitations of this conception of freedom. Um, so <clears throat> various predatory debt contracts, which in include sharecropping, um, and also um, most of our debt contracts today as well, like credit card contracts and so forth, I think um, are at least exploitative in certain ways. So um, we've got those kinds of, those, the limitations of those contracts for realizing freedom. But then also Kant has this really nice discussion at one point um, of debt and servility. And he says, you know, when you go into debt, it makes you servile. You have to give up your freedom. You, you, you are now have to live at the whim of your creditors. You are constrained in these ways by being in debt until you can pay it off. And Kant's response, you know, Kant's takeaway from this is don't go into debt. Um, but of course, we know that this isn't really a possibility for most people today. Um, and what I think instead, so this I think is a nice illustration of the limitation of this conception of freedom. But I think also um, it's a nice, what Kant is saying is a nice way of articulating the worry that folks have today about debt that theorists have today, um, which is exactly this idea of servility, right? And that this is widespread and unavoidable for most folks. Okay, so then also I think it, the notion of debt uh, or debt really exemplifies the strengths and limitations of moral freedom as well that we find in morality in the philosophy of right. Um, and I'll just mention again, debtors' prisons and bankruptcy protections. Uh, actually, I think Elizabeth Anderson misses something that anthropologists have been, point, have been um, pulling out, which is the literature that's, uh, there's a literature on the actual demise of debtors' prisons. What were the arguments that swayed the day? And it turns out a lot of them were moral arguments. So the, we, there were market norms functioning, right? Um, but there were also moral arguments being mustered that actually won the day. And similarly, in the rise of bankruptcy protections, there's a similar story to tell about the role that the idea of moral freedom plays there. Um, but also, and this is something I've published on previously, I think the financial crisis itself is a really nice illustration of the empty formalism critique, because in the empty formalism critique, um, Hegel is basically saying, you know, the applications of the categorical imperative always depend on implicit assumptions about the broader context, specifically here, the social and economic context. And those assumptions import content into what is supposed to be a purely formal principle. And I think the financial crisis is an excellent illustration of that because there are all these decisions being made, all these maxims being considered that simply can't be, we cannot adequately evaluate them in the absence of thinking about the broader assumptions that we're, that are, um, that we're all sort of in mesh and that we're all making. Um, and the, the crisis really showed some, how, you know, how wrong some of those assumptions were. Okay. So then the final, um, the final conception of freedom, of course, in the philosophy of right is this idea of social freedom that we find in ethical life. And here, um, I think there are kind of two, um, two lessons I wanna take from this. So first of all, I think the key takeaway from Nietzsche on debt, he's got this you know, critique of the religious cultural um, uh, phenomenon of debt. But I think the key takeaway from him is that debt, or much debt, we don't, don't want to say all debt, but a lot of debt today is a form of misrecognition. Um, it's a way that our self-understandings, our, our values and our norms, our relationships, our social practices, um, our institutions, they're all deformed and twisted to serve the ends of debt. Um, and if something like this is true, if this is a form of misrecognition, then I, I think one thing that's going on is that we've got, you know, Hegel's articulating this great conception of freedom, which is, you know, beyond, goes beyond what uh, sort of the abstract right conception, which is the one that we're most, you know, most people in culture are familiar with. It's helpful for understanding debt. 
But if Nietzsche is right, I think, then I think this is also perhaps a problem for Hegel because the kind of misrecognition he's talking about is one that goes back to very early human societies, not the earliest human life, but very early human societies as we're being, as our ancestors were being forced into um, these violent arrangements um, to serve the interests of elites. Um, and if this is true, then it, the kind of misrecognition, it precedes modernity, it precedes capitalism, certainly financialization um, that's occurred in the last uh, 40 years. And it's a problem also, I think, that is separate from the, the issues, the, the problems of inequality and the rabble that are a little more familiar within the Hegel, um, within Hegel discussion. I, I, when I originally started thinking about this topic for this paper and how to talk about Hegel together with debt, I was thinking, I was reading Terry's work on inequality in Hegel, and I found that really interesting and trying to think about how to fold this into that discussion of inequality. And of course, also thinking about that and, and discussions of the rabble. Um, but it simply is a problem that stands on its own, I think. It is certainly something that feeds inequality and marginalization or the rabble. There's a lot of, and poverty, there's a lot of um, evidence of that. But I think it's also a separate problem of recognition um, that raises perhaps deeper questions for Hegel. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Kate, do you mind um, sharing? Yeah, your... sorry, there we go, yeah. got it. Okay, great, oh, we already have hands up. Okay, excellent. Uh, Mark, why don't you go first? That was a wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful talk, very clear and helpful. And I, I had like one, one question about the use of Nietzsche and one question about a potential place in Hegel where, where some animal resources might be found. I, one of the things that I, I found congenial about Graeber's book on debt is what he, that, is that he actually thinks that Nietzsche's idea that like, you know, the way he theorizes how debt is the origin of moral obligation in genealogy is like insane. Like it's just, there's just no way it's correct because like it's, it, there's, there's no evidence for it. And there's this picture where people really enjoy hurting other people. And so they're willing to like, you know, give them some money so that they can get the possibility of inflicting damage on their bodies. And like, I thought that the Graeber's way of seeing this is a reductio ad absurdum of a premise of bourgeois understandings of what morality is. And that he's really right that that can't be true. Like this is of course me being, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't do the video me consistently criticizing German philosophers for having inaccurate views of the history. But I was wondering whether that part, whether what you have to say about that part of Graeber's reading of Nietzsche, which is that it, that he, he says, I don't think he's reading Nietzsche as actually correct about the history of this, but he's seeing it as like a way of seeing what's wrong with our own moral concepts, that they depend on this false genealogy of, of debt. And then the other question I, I had or suggestion, I was wondering what you would make of it, is that, as I said, Hegel doesn't talk a lot about debt, but he does talk about should, I mean, uh, responsibility, which is sort of cut very similar, of course, something I've thought a lot about. And I was thinking that a natural place to think about what resources he would have would be the dialectic of confession and forgiveness. Because the concept we would need to think about is what it means to forgive responsibilities or forgive debts. And that that might give us a way of thinking about like, you know, the debtors prisons and bankruptcy laws, all of these are ways of releasing, it's just showing that that economy of debt is sort of within our social control. And it's something that could be responsive to a kind of dynamic. I was wondering if that was interesting, an interesting suggestion to you or not. Thank yeah, you. thank you so much. Those are great, great, both great questions. Um, that, and I, I, that's a great suggestion to look at Hegel on forgiveness. Um, part of my own, so I, I think the, one of the reasons that that's maybe not quite where I wanna go, although I think it's a, I think I should do that too. Um, I think that the idea of debt forgiveness is the wrong concept. I think the goal um, should be sort of repudiation of a criminal. So this kind of brings out a sort of somewhat more radical bent to this view, but um, the idea that instead of forgiving our debts, there's nothing to forgive. We're only, they only should be forgiven if we're guilty, essentially, right? Or if, if, we, if they have something to forgive. Um, but I think that would be really helpful to look at in Hegel because that's, I've, you know, I've combed through Hegel looking for these kinds of um, discussions of debt and trying to put them together, but I think that'd be really helpful. So that's helpful. Thank you. Um, yeah, and you know, it's so hard to know what to do with Graeber. I find him so impossible to read. <laughs> Nietzsche at least has the advantage of 
having a nice consistent story, even though there's no historical evidence for a lot of it. There is historical evidence that, uh, you know, and anthropologists agree that debt goes back to the beginning of human society, but um, the rest of it is all sort of, you know, may, uh, there's no evidence for this essentially. Um, although I will say the one thing I thought, I find the most compelling account of where money comes from. So Smith proposed the, the myth of barter, essentially, right? That we were all bartering and then we tried to find more and more stable forms of things to trade, essentially, to make it more efficient. And this is just, anthropologists have just totally rejected this. This is just totally false. Um, and so there have been, so where does money come from then? What's going on? And I think the most compelling account is basically an account that sees all money as debt. And it started when sort of tribal leaders started handing out tokens to their lieutenants as a way of showing, conferring recognition upon them, right? Saying like, oh, you, you're one of my lieutenants, you get special tokens. And then at some point, these lieutenants start trading them within themselves and with other people. And that's the beginning of money. Um, and so, and the to but the tokens are originally a debt to the leader, right? It's a way of solidifying the leader's power. Um, so, uh, I think, you know, that, that's a sort of piece of evidence, perhaps, that doesn't say exactly what Nietzsche says, but I think goes to the kind of idea that there's power and it's really about power and violence um, and putting a moral sheen on this violence. Um, so thank you so much. Those are great comments. Those are great. Okay, great. Uh, Arash, you're next. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, uh, and thank you very much for working on this topic. And, and there are not so many philosophers doing this kind of work. I really appreciate it. So the, my question is, uh, is a kind of suggestion and, uh, and, uh, and that is, uh, I think one thing that we can learn from Hegel's treatment of philosophical, philosophy in the object, the spirit is somehow to sociologize, sociologize uh, concepts and we give them some kind of sociological content. So I think that, for example, we can distinguish different levels of different forms of debt. Um, maybe they are not even the same phenomenon. So the debt of some, like if I borrow some money from you, it's then I should perhaps uh, you know, like give it back to you. But it's this is one form of debt, but then the form of debt that, for example, Greece is indebted to the EU is, is just another, it's, I, I don't think that is the same concept, it's a completely different concept, and I don't think that they should ever try to give it back to you. Or like the kind of debt that, for example, a student gets for studying from like big financial institutions in the US. So, I just like like purely philosophical approach, like Nietzsche, like as you depicted it. I mean, it leaves out some sociological nuances, uh, and uh, and I take the uh, that I think because you said about that, you, you know, one can use this as a kind of critic of Hill's critic of empty formalism of Kant. But uh, I just want to know uh, one. Uh, if you have anything to say about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. This is um, part of why this topic has become so fascinating to me. It's um, so multifaceted, right? We could talk, there are so many things we can talk about with debt. We could talk about national debt. And that's a topic I've generally tried to stay away from precisely for the reason you mentioned. I think that these are very different kinds of debt um, and it requires its own treatment in a way. Um, but even if we talk about personal debt, there are radical differences between different kinds of them. And um, I think that there is a place here for um, philosophers to try and distinguish these things and bring some clarity to this debate, to this issue. Um, but you know, I, there was a point in which when I was a few years ago, when I was working on debt, that I, I kind of was about ready to throw up my hands because of the complexity of it. And because it is so, it's just so um, hard to get a grasp on all the parts of it. And at some point I was like, this is like the, you know, the metaphor of the elephant, um, you know, the blind, the blind person coming and touching the elephant. And we all touch the elephant from different sides. We can't figure out what it is because I'm blindfolded and touching the tail. You're blindfolded and touching an ear. And we can't, it's so massive that we cannot get a, a grasp on it. And I've decided not to give in to that sort of like, it's, it's too hard to grasp. Um, but I think there is a real need to distinguish between these different kinds. And I, you know, my focus here is narrow, um, but I do think there are implications for other parts of it. And 
So for instance, when we talk about like Greece's debt um, and debt, that debt repudiation, I think there are versions of that in personal debt as well. Um, Greece is not, you know, there are, there are kinds of national debt that are similar to kinds of personal debt or situations that people, individuals are in with regard to their debt. So they can't be totally, there's still something common to them um, is what I would say. Thank you. Thank you. Great, Olivia, you're next. Thank you so much, Kate. What a fascinating paper and a wonderful application of a couple of philosophers to a contemporary problem. I just wondered um, what you would think about that. One of the things that it, that came to my mind thinking about the way Hegel talks about choice and obligation in different parts of ethical life. So Hegel's generally comfortable with saying that there are some institutions, especially like the family and the state, where we kind of inherit obligations. And that doesn't mean that we uh, are enslaved in some way, but it does mean that even though we don't choose to be in a particular family or choose to be a citizen of a particular state, there are ways in which being a, living a full ethical life means fulfilling those obligations. And then, of course, civil society is supposed to be the more volition and more personal choice and personal expression. And I love this quote that you emphasize of Hegel's, only he who wills to be coerced can be coerced into anything. Um, and part of what's interesting about the, the scheme you lay out is that you make it clear that in a way that going into debt has become a condition of the possibility of functioning or flourishing in our society such that if you don't go into debt, where do you get your health care? Where do you get your child care? Where do you get your education, et cetera? And it almost starts to, fade. and, and I, I, this reminds me both of Jay Bernstein and Robert Pippin's papers the last couple of days, when capitalism shifts to the kind of capitalism we have now, it almost becomes a, a new kind of institution and into which we're born and have much less choice about whether we can uh, you know, choose to go into debt or not. And whether, I just wondered if you could just speculate about whether Hegel has some, um, tools with which to address how an institution that was supposed to be more like civil society now becomes something in which we have much less choice about the kinds of ways we can fulfill our obligations um, to it. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Um, you know, the thing is, I think that, and this is one thing I like about Nietzsche going back so early and thinking about debt so broadly is it doesn't have to be the, the case that debt is bad, right? I think we often think of it as this bad thing. And a lot of the kind of debt I'm talking about is bad, of course. But, um, you know, I owe debts to my parents, for instance, and they are of that sort, right? And they come from family. And I owe debts that I just sort of, I just have these debts as being in the world. And they're not bad debts. I'm not talking about financial debts. I'm talking about, you know, I have debts to help, to help care for them and love them and so forth. Um, and so it doesn't have to be the case that debt is something that uh, is a bad thing. And it can be the kind of, I mean, it's just sort of part of being in human relationships is that we have these debts to one another. So then the question is, why, how did some of them become, take on this life of their own, as you say, right? Um, and it connects to these other topics um, that we've been talking about. Um, and I think that this is, um, you know, I, there's a point at the, in Terry's paper on inequality from a few years ago, um, where he talks about civil society kind of um, is, a, the abstract right is sort of taking over ethical life, right? And sort of cannibalizing it in a way. And I think that's what where it's going on. And this literature on financialization has been, uh, is really, it's all these folks pointing out ways in which this is occurring. Um, so if you even think about um, financial and debt metaphors in our personal relationships, I, I, this is kind of shameful to admit, but I once had uh, a partner who, you know, was tipsy and said to me, your stock is rising, which meant that they, you know, they, they liked me or something like that, right? And th this is commonplace. This, it's like a joke, but it's also, uh, you know, and I said, no, 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 you're not going to, we're not going to talk about our relationship as though it's a financial market. But um, the, this, is a, this is common that it's sort of seeping in in all these ways that we don't even see. And how does that occur? And one way of describing it would be, um, you know, in terms of uh, abstract right taking over 
um, these other areas and turning, you know, even finance, even debts between and within families, right, being made into something financial, as opposed to what it's, you know, what it had been, which is just, I, I need to take care of my parents in their old age or something like that and love them. Right? Yeah, that's, that's great. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, we have six questions. And uh, so again, if we can keep uh, the uh, questions and answers uh, both brief and under four minutes each exchange, that would be great. Uh, okay, Jacob, you're next. Thanks, I really enjoyed this. Um, so I wanted to sort of put together Mark's idea of looking at Hegel on forgiveness and Arash's idea of there being a difference between an individual owing a debt and owing a debt to like an institution or a country and ask you a little bit about ethical life and the administration of justice. So there Hegel says something that I think is very interesting and useful for your project, which is that we're a little more lenient in the administration of justice than we are in abstract right. So in abstract right, it pretty much is an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And in the administration of justice, when somebody commits a crime, we can afford to sort of be more lenient in our punishment because it's the social whole that they've hurt and the social whole is sort of more durable than the individual. So I guess in light of that, I, yeah, I wanted to sort of know if you're amenable to that suggestion that like maybe resources for thinking about Hegel on forgiving debts or on at least relaxing um, debts or, or uh, uh, that, that there's some way like the administration of justice and the way that it softens abstract right um, it helps get us there. Mm. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, I will go check that out. That's a really good suggestion. Um, so part of the uh, part of the challenge of this topic is that there are these different as there's aspects of, in terms of justice and what is the um, how should we handle say bankruptcy and debt discharge, debt forgiveness. Um, I was in this wonderful roundtable on um, the bankruptcy essentially a couple of years ago with some legal theorists um, and how to actually put this into place especially when we've got um, the rise of just all sorts of really creative uh, clever in this in the sense that Odysseus is clever they're sort of diabolically clever ways of getting around uh, you know contracts essentially um, that that lending companies are utilizing now and um, my large, my primary focus is really on trying to rethink the ethical concepts here in terms of, um, I, I think that this, I, like I encounter this every single time I go to an ethics conference and talk about this topic, um, is this kind of resistance to this idea that there's a problem with debt because it's just so simple. Um, it's just so, there's nothing to say at all. And I have to kind of explain to people why there is something interesting going on ethically. So that is kind of my interest is this idea of, is this notion of a counter ethics of debt and how to rethink the ethics of debt. But um, the questions of how this um, could be implemented in the law um, and in institutions of justice, right? I think that's a, a really important question. So I'll, I'll go look that up. Thank you. Thanks. Great, Dean, you next. Great. Um, yeah, thanks, Katie. This is just an amazing paper. And I'm like, Arash, just want to say thank you for, for working on this topic, which seems so central. I mean, I'm occasionally beginning my introductory, uh, you know, classics of Western philosophy course to freshmen with a kind of lecture to them, like, don't believe what our financial uh, advisors are telling you about your debt, really make sure you read the fine print. This is something you really have to take seriously. So I'm glad you're doing this work. Um, I guess just to try to move you a little bit more into the what, what how we can, you know, use this discussion to talk about the philosophy of right. I just wanted to, since I wrote this book on value, I've been kind of obsessing about the topic of, of value there, which is obviously central to questions of debt too. My first kind of aside, um, because you mentioned Elizabeth Anderson, she came up yesterday in Robert Pippin's talk. Um, is just to say that this book of hers, which is her dissertation, I guess, uh, Value and Ethics and Economics, is just a deeply Hegelian book. And if you read, if you read her exchange in Ethics two years later with uh, responding to critics, she actually admits that her view is Hegelian. And so I, I sort of mentioned this in my uh, introduction, just to say we have somebody who's very prominent doing amazing work in political philosophy, who's actually like kind of on our team. Um, that's just kind of an aside. Uh, 
The other thing that I do spend a lot of time on and which might be useful for your project is this section 299. Um, and so I wanted to just sort of point you to that and maybe raise a question about, about it. So in, in section 299, the philosophy of right, which is right at the beginning of the legislative power, Hegel says, somewhat surprisingly, that it's great that our, what we owe to the state is now conceived in terms of money. So it's basically like a celebration of taxes and that what the value that we need to return to the state for all that it does for us can be given in terms of money. Um, and, you know, this is surprising insofar as it, you might think given some other things, Hegel says that he would take more of a Rousseauian view that we should actually, you know, return concrete services to the state and so on. Um, I'll just read one line, um, because when I say this, it almost sounds unbelievable if you're reading other parts of Hegel's system. Um, and this is just like the last uh, sentence into the main text of 299. And I should also mention, he doesn't use the concept of Schuld here. So it's unclear to me that he's actually thinking about the individual state relation as one of debt and debtor. And that might be interesting to you, like, is there an alternative that he's got in mind? Because it's definitely supposed to be some kind of equivalence here. Um, but he says, as for services to the state, it is only when these are expressed in terms of money as the existing and universal value of things and services that they can be determined justly and at the same time in such a way that the particular work and services which the individual can perform are mediated by his own arbitrary will. Um, so my question really is, because I, I cite this in Hegel as an example of his realism, the sense that he just saw this was essential to the modern world. He thinks it's essential for justice that we have this abstract conception of value as money. And, but I worry, and I wonder how much you worry about whether just the form of money and its prevalence in the modern world is itself a kind of cause of the exploitative and predatory debt life and financialization that's going on now. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great passage. Thank you so much for highlighting that. And also, um, I, I, it's nice to know that Elizabeth Anderson is explicitly sort of copying through these Hegel, <laughs> this Hegel, uh, you know, connection or, you know, interest in Hegel, because um, I, this article in particular that I've, you know, read on that I look, have used on debtors prisons, um, it, she never mentions Hegel once, but it seemed like, it seems like a strikingly Hegelian argument, basically, that she makes. Um, and so, yeah, the, clearly the debt situation today is one that is framed by money. I, I think though that um, Nietzsche and Graeber are right to some extent to say this goes back before money, but, um, but of course money is the thing that um, it, it existed for a very long time. Um, and, more and more of our lives are valued are valued in terms of money, right? So I think we get this sort of perfect storm of uh, financial financialized debt now because of the combination of those two things. Um, but I think it goes back as earlier as well, which I guess is my thought that this is a deeper problem perhaps for Hegel and for realizing the so social freedom, the freedom of um, that Hegel's trying to describe at least in ethical life. Um, but this is a great, that's a great passage. And this idea that what we owe to the state is should be understood in terms of money and that's a good thing, right? Um, uh, especially because, I mean, if you look at a dollar bill even, it's, it specifically says on it that it's a debt that we owe to the state. Our debt, our money, it has a claw, it has a phrase on it that says that this is based basically a debt that we owe um, to the state that could be called at any time. And so these kind of theories of money that see money at fundamentally as a debt um, are ones that are highlighting this kind of like, we're already, uh, it's money, we've, we've been given money by the treasury department essentially to opt to you know, fulfill our needs and so forth. Um, but it, it's, it's a way of holding us in place. So you get um, folks, for instance, who want to then uh, reject the idea, or they want to, uh, it's, it's illegal to use other kinds of currency of legal tender, for instance, in the United States, and pretty much all countries have this, um, that there is a requirement that you can only use this currency as legal tender, and that's a way of controlling who we owe this debt to. So one way of undermining state power, let's say, 
would be to um, develop alternative forms of currency. So a while ago, at least, and before cryptocurrencies became what they are today, um, there were folks who were trying to envision cryptocurrency as an alternative form of currency that would then kind of break this um, stranglehold on how we can um, operate in the marketplace. Um, so that takes far away from what you were saying, Dean. Um, but thank you, I appreciate that. Um, and I will, I will look at those things. Okay, great. Robert, you're next. Thanks very much. Yeah, that's really fascinating. I, I was just wondering, so you mentioned briefly that um, you're not committed to claiming all forms of debt are a bad thing. Uh, and I think you mentioned that in relation to debt in the sense of owing to your parents and so on. But I, I mean, I just wonder what you think of, a, of another argument of that sort, um, which I think you can find in a sort of religious tradition, which is that you need a notion of debt to God um, to, in order to overcome pride. And if that pride isn't overcome, then uh, love of the neighbor is impossible. So putting it another way around, I mean, if you think you're entirely self, uh, self-created, as it were, and, and self-generated, um, and you owe nothing to anything, um, you'll become a kind of moral monster. Um, so some notion of debt has to be built into ethics um, on that view. I mean, and an example, I mean, my, well, I don't want to offend anyone, but I mean, one of the monstrous things about Trump, it, it, it might be said to be his sense of self-empowerment, uh, owing no, nothing to anyone. Um, and, and, and that may not be an accident, that that's how he turned out. So some notion of debt of that kind is, is central to ethics. Would that, would you go along with that? Yeah, that's a wonderful way of stating, um, I, I think that's absolutely, and that's why I, I, I love looking at this in terms of ethics, because I think there's a lot to critique, but also this is just a way we relate to one another. We, and we always have, and we always will, right? It, to be a social being of our, of our sorts, maybe bees don't have debts. So, you know, we think of other hyper-social species who don't have the sort of cognitive abilities we have, um, that maybe they don't have debts, but to be these beings of the sort that we are is to be in debt to one another. Otherwise you're living alone essentially, right? And that's not possible for us to live alone for our entire lives. Um, and so debt is part of who we are. So the question is, what should that look like? When is it objectionable? And when is it actually, I, I love this way of putting it, you know, you'd be, you'd be a monster if you sort of try to extract yourself entirely from this and, hover and refuse to be indebted to anyone. You'd be a monster of sorts, right? Um, and that this is part of participating in, a, in healthy social relationships that enable us to you know, have well-being and be free and so forth. But, but also, just quickly, I mean, I think it's a dismantling of pride that is the cru crucial idea. Yeah, that's that's great. Thank you. Um, mm. Yeah. You know, I will just mention in this context, there's a, um, there are forms of, there are debts within families, and I don't mean to just say sort of um, they, occur, they pop up sporadically or something. There are forms of debt within families um, that are even operating sometimes as cultural norms that are, can be very destructive as well. So um, the, we, again, we have to not um, you know, romanticize any of them, but um, that's a great idea to think about this in terms of pride and even connecting it to Donald Trump. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, great. Alan, you're next. Uh, thank you. Um, I just uh, I just wanted to point. Um, I'm not sure if you uh, mentioned this uh, in your paper. I just wanted to point out that Hegel does uh, discuss uh, debt uh, in paragraph 127 in connection with the right of necessity, and he says that um, uh, the right of necessity uh, applies not only in you know, well, discrete emergency situations and, and as an exception to law, but, it, it, um, but the right, a right of necessity is actually, uh, in some cases, embodied in law and, uh, and applies to a more ongoing kind of need. And the example he gives is, is the, um, uh, is the uh, what he calls the, the well, what the, uh, the Romans called uh, beneficium competentiae, whereby, uh, here I'm quoting, where a debtor is allowed to retain of his tools, farming implements, clothes, or in short, of his resources, 
uh, i.e. of his creditor's property, so much as is regarded as indispensable if he is to continue to support life, uh, to support it, of course, on his own social level. So, so uh, here he's, he's, he's saying that uh, part, uh, partial forgiveness of, uh, of debt uh, embodies uh, uh, this uh, right of necessity vis-a-vis -vis abstract right. So uh, just as uh, necessity in general uh, trumps abstract right in these circumstances, so does so do these laws protecting uh, the uh, the debtor trump abstract right. So here we have um, uh, the, the right of necessity embodies this richer notion of freedom, richer than the one in abstract right, right? Not just formal agency, but uh, a richer conception of self-determination. So I was wondering if, if you thought that that um, that sufficed, that was that was enough for uh, um, um, uh, an ethical law of debt, or or do we have to do we have to go be beyond that? Is there has Hegel said all that one needs to say here about the um, the ethics of uh, debt and debt forgiveness, or do we have to go further? Yeah, thank you so much. So with with the right of necessity, is that enough, right? To, to, to point to the right of necessity. And, or, uh, and this is a, I, I actually did have looked at that passage, but thank you for bringing it up, uh, highlighting it. Um, he's going back to Justinian there and these sort of initial codes, legal codes on debt um, and trying to you know, bring some of that forward. And the answer, I think the answer to your question is no, I don't think it's sufficient at all. Um, I th and I think in part because the um, norms, so if you think about this idea of a moral imperative of repayment, so, uh, and uh, the way that, you know, think of, to think about for folks who are indebted for, let's say all of their lives, and a lot of times they're borrowing just to make ends meet, right? This is a fair, fairly large segment of the population actually, is not engaging in what um, Smith and Bentham talk about as investment debt, which is language we now have um, taken on. They're engaging in debt for the purpose of consumption, but really just to meet their needs, just to get by through the day. I don't think then that talking about uh, the right of necessity is going to be enough. That's a way to sort of say, oh no, well, it's gotten so bad that we need to make sure that, you know, you're still able to live or something like that. That's what we see in bankruptcy law um, and in debates over bankruptcy law, which, how far does that go? Um, but I don't think that gets to these deeper issues of how are we valuing, how, how, how strong do we see this imperative of repayment and how are we valuing debt versus, repaying debt versus other um, obligations we have, for instance. Um, oh shoot, there was one other thing I wanted to say, but I lost it. Um, can, I, can I just um, um, just say one more thing? So, so it seems to me that if you, if you want to go beyond what Hegel is, uh, has uh, said here, uh, wouldn't you, wouldn't you have to, wouldn't that actually uh, contradict abstract right, uh, uh, overthrow it? Because uh, the way Hegel presents the right of necessity, it doesn't overthrow abstract right, it, it, just, it just limits it. And, um, and even in, in, where, where, where you apply the right of necessity, if you can, if you have to take something to save your life, you know, uh, you, if you, you still have to to repay the person you took it from at some point down the road. So, so he doesn't overthrow abstract, right? He just limits it in these uh, special circumstances. But now if you want to go further than that and say, well, you don't have to re repay it even apart from a right of necessity. I apologize to intervene here a little bit. So we do have uh, two more questions and uh, we don't have that much time. So Kate, if you could, uh briefly respond to that one, and then we'll move on to the last two questions. That would be great. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. I think that this is, that's a, a nice way of putting that. What this is exactly the interface of how should we see ethical life and, uh, or the, the interface between ethical life and um, abstract right, right? Um, the, the question of how, what is the place of abstract right within ethical life? Um, is really raised in a pressing way by this example. So I, I take that, um, and thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, Sebastian, you're next. 
Hey, uh, great paper. Thank you very much. Um, I, I want to just ask a question about the misrecognition that you identify and the extent to which you think it can be ameliorated through uh, education. And I mean education not to victim blame, but education of the debtor, right? I mean, like, in other words, to, to tell them, like, look, you know, like, you're, what, what you're doing is you're paying a premium, you know, because you're using someone else's capital for a while, so you got to compensate them for that, and then for risk, right? And part of the risk is that you're not going to pay them back you already paid them for that, right? I mean, like, in other words, like, in general, this debt includes a payment for them to absorb that risk. And they're the risk professionals, they've loaned it to you, and they lost. And I mean, like, why not just, right? I mean, like, this was an aspect of the Occupy movement that I found uh, very gratifying to my sense of justice, that the part of it that was trying to encourage people to abandon their underwater homes, right, and just walk away and say, look, you Take, keep the house. You decided the house was adequate collateral for this loan. So take your collateral. I'm, I'm gone. Right. And like that, that to me, I mean, you know, to what extent do you think these misrecognition things also just have to do with like, let's say the overwhelming sophistication of the financial markets and a need to educate people about them so that they can recognize their own position in them. And, and right. And I mean, here, I, I don't, you know, it pains me to say this, but like, one of the nice things I think that probably people recognized in Trump, one of the reasons that they uh, found him so satisfying is that, you know, he uh, knew how to do this, right? Uh, in other words, like people were kind of mystified. Oh, he's a terrible businessman. He keeps going bankrupt. But I think a lot of people said, no, he's, he's, you know, like he, he's doing what we should all do, which is tell the banks to, you know, stuff it. Uh, you know, so I, I mean, I just wonder what you think about that you know, uh, that side of the, of, of like, you know, a strategy for making things better. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, I think two things. Um, first of all, the, I, the, you know, what's gratifying about that, not put aside the, the, the Trump for just a minute, um, but what's gratifying about watching people walk away from these underwater mortgages after the fact, after the financial crisis, um, I think there, this is exactly what um, sort of debt activists are trying to bring people together to do. But the problem is financial education is not going to solve that. So, uh, you know, I've worked somewhat with uh, folks in, we have a financial counseling and planning department here at my university where they teach people to be financial planners um, and go out into the world and have this job. And they are themselves very critical of this industry. So the faculty, at least the ones I've worked with over there, are like, wow, we're training all these students to do this. And yes, it's useful information that they will impart to their clients and so forth and so on. But that is not a solution to this problem, in part because, as you say, financial markets are so complex. They're so complex that nobody understands them. There are people who understand segments of them, right? And typically, those people are trying, are trying to figure out ways to utilize them for their own interests. Um, that's and they understand that little piece of it, but nobody understands the bulk of it. Um, and so uh, risk is something that that's actually a, uh, one of my big projects at the moment is thinking about the ethics of risk and consent to financial contracts and what does that look like and trying to articulate different models of financial consent than we have come to rely on. Um, but I so I think that this emphasis on and I think at least some folks over in that um, part of my university would say, you know, this emphasis on financial education is, first of all, it's, it's not, it's, a, it's something that most people won't be able to access, but it's also something that wouldn't really solve any problem. And it, all it does is really cast things back in terms of personal responsibility, which is exactly what we're trying to move away from. And so walking people, watching people walk away from an underwater mortgage, that's an individual thing. I think what's, what we have to look at, though, um, from an ethical perspective is what what kind of violence that person is actually kind of experiencing internally when they walk away to want to throw off these norms that tell you absolutely must repay this is your responsibility the intense shame and guilt that people report in these experiences it's not a joke right this is and this is you know undermining their health and their well-being they're so ashamed and they're having to push they're trying to push back on them and the, the difficulty of that because it's so deeply ingrained that's only some that's something we can't do as individuals we have to kind of work on it together you know there are going to be a few exceptions right but uh, we risk becoming trumps becoming moral monsters right in the process um because it's so it's such an intense experience for them and there's you know accounts of this of how how difficult it is even people going through bankruptcy court often are experiencing intense shame and guilt that is really disruptive to their health and well-being um okay so, all right 
<laughs> Good. Uh, I'm given permission to go over just a couple minutes uh, for the last question. Okay, Christopher. I'll be really short in part because I mainly got scooped by Dean already. Um, and so all I was going to add is I think the, the great contrast to that passage on 299 in section 299 is now I'm paying taxes to the state. What I used to owe was compulsory labor service to my manorial lord, right? I used to have to take in his harvest, and now I can go out on the market, the labor market, and I can do some things for myself and so on. So I, I mean that only because uh, to say, in a certain sense, it's certainly right that, that Hegel doesn't have a lot to say about financial debt in the way that we think about it. Um, but he was aware of a society in which personal labor obligations were widespread, widely resented and condemned, and had a lot to say about those sorts of arrangements. So I'm, I'm just wondering whether you think of those as debt, sort of as non-monetary debt, in a way that's relevant to you. And thanks for the project. It's a really interesting project. Oh, thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, and it's a, um, that's a great way of framing this in terms of how is this an improvement upon what came before? Um, and also how is it not living up to the goals at the same time? Um, the, when we think about taxation, right, as a way of discharging this debt or as a way of, um, instead of being compelled through a non-monetary debt, um, and then we have a taxation, we have taxation said, oh shoot, there was, as you were saying this, there was something I wanted to um, point to, but I'm just, uh, um, anyway, thank you so much. That's, that's an excellent question. I will, and if I, if I think of the other thing I want to say, I will send you an email real quick. <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. Okay, thank you so much. Let's uh, thank our speaker for a great talk and very interesting discussion. Uh, and thank you all for being patient. Uh, okay, so now we're gonna have a one hour break and see you again in, uh, in an hour. Bye.